Hello, hello, this is Week by Week. I'm Celeste, and before I talk about how pregnant I am, I want to just stop and say this episode's going to be a little different. This episode, I am 34, 35, and 36 weeks pregnant, and I want to be vulnerable about why that is. The last little bit of this pregnancy has been really difficult. And not only for the typical, I'm in third trimester, I'm exhausted, and I'm uncomfortable kind of reasons, but also because my baby's measuring small. We have a plan and we're tracking it. We go to see my OBGYN once a week, which is pretty typical at this point in the pregnancy, but we also go to a high-risk clinic once a week. And together, they're monitoring his development and just making sure everything is still progressing the way we want to see. So it's been really tough. But the good news is, so far, everything's still looking really good. So why is this happening? Well, the short answer is, I don't know. My doctor has speculated that the placenta function might be decreasing. And I just want to stop and say how incredible it is that your body creates an entire organ just for pregnancy. But with that, it's only supposed to last as long as a pregnancy lasts. And sometimes they can stop functioning as effectively even earlier than that. That might be what's happening. My high-risk doctor said that it also could be something to do with a hematoma. They're not sure. But we're monitoring it and trying to keep him inside as long as possible. But it also means we could have a baby a little sooner than we expected. So we're on this journey together. Okay, so getting back to the podcast, I have had to honor myself a little bit in the last couple weeks and take a breath and take a break. I'm still going to do updates for the next couple weeks. I'm just taking a small pause from interviews, and I promise we'll get back to them. I have gotten so much out of my conversations, and I'm excited to get back to it. I just, for the sake of everything, need to honor where I am. So yeah, we're going to start off with a solo update for week 34, and I'll jump back in before week 35. All right, here we go. This week for me has been tough. I have been getting horrible sleep, like just cannot sleep through the night between having to get up and pee all the time and having really vivid dreams and some nightmares. And I think this week it really hit me and Dave how close we are to the end of this part of the journey. And it's really been on our minds, which feels obvious, but also It's the anticipation and anxiety and excitement. It's just, it's a lot. So that's been one of the big things. We are now going twice a week and we will be going twice a week from here on out till the end of the pregnancy to the doctor. We go once a week to the high-risk clinic and then once a week to my regular OBGYN. And both times they take a look at how the baby is growing, and then also do an NST. According to Google, NST, or a non-stress test, is a simple, non-invasive way of checking on your baby's health. The test records your baby's movement, heartbeat, and contractions. It notes changes in the heart rhythm when your baby goes from resting to moving or during contractions if you're in labor. So basically, I have these two little circle monitors on my stomach, one for the heart rate and one for the contractions. And then usually for about 20 minutes or so, they leave the sensors on me and they just monitor him. And it like prints out this long sheet that's kind of fun to look at and takes a look at what's going on. So it's a good way to stay connected to what's going on with him and keep an eye out for how his function is continuing specifically because my placenta is just not doing what we wish it was doing. The good news is I did find a doctor at the high-risk clinic who I really like, so I've made the rest of my appointments for the rest of the pregnancy with him. He was very, very thorough and attentive, but also gave me some peace of mind while still making me feel like if something came up, he would be very proactive and aware of it. So it was a good, it seems like a good fit. One benefit of going through this experience during COVID-19 is he is a doctor who is typically traveling and doing a lot of lectures and generally hard to book and pretty unavailable. But because of this time, he's doing all of those via his computer. So he's there. So silver linings, I guess. Also, when I was at my one of my appointments this past week, 
we saw him sucking and swallowing. And every time you just see his mouth open, it's just the cutest thing in the world. And then you could see his nose. He was pushing his nose right up to the placenta, which is such a funny sentence when I said it out loud, I actually realized. But it was cute. It was like he's pushing his nose up against a window or something. I guess I'm a mom now because I find things like that darling. So according to some of these stats, baby is now somewhere between 17 and 18 inches long and around five pounds. And he's about the size of a butternut squash or a pineapple. And I'm going to go with pineapple because I love pineapple. And also, oh my gosh, I have just been daydreaming about Hawaii and how much I want to go back. And that's been like my peaceful place to imagine as we've been going through this whole experience. So yay, Hawaii, a little Hawaii baby. Oh, something I forgot to mention, but is happening all the time. He gets so many hiccups. And it's such a weird feeling because it's like this rhythmic, deep pulsing sort of. And it's always in the same spot because he's pretty much in his position that he's going to stay in, it seems like, until birth. And he's head down, as I've mentioned before. But his little body is on my left side. And it's just like this weird rhythmic thing. And I always make Dave put his hand on it when it happens. And I always feel so bad because I can't soothe him when that happens. But... My doctor did say it is a really good sign that the brain and the body are talking to each other and that the body or the diaphragm specifically is responding to what is going on. So a good developmental sign. Oh, whoa, this is cool. According to my book, it says baby is now able to see color, although the only color available is the red inside of your uterus. So, well, I love red. That's one of my favorite colors, but... You will see many more colors once you're born, baby boy. But until then, how cool is that? So for mom, it says, as baby starts to take up more room, there is less amniotic fluid to cushion baby's movements. As a result, you might feel sharp jabs or kicks. You can even watch your belly protrude when the baby extends his arm or leg. And so I've definitely seen like waves of movement from my stomach when I've looked at it. And I I was just saying to Dave as we were going on a walk the other day, it feels more like bones now. And I don't know if that's exactly what I'm feeling, but it must be that like lessening of amniotic fluid where you do get these kind of like sharper, like, oh, whoa, it feels like something more whole, I guess, is moving around. It's not just like a a wave-like movement. It, it feels more like sharp, like they said, which is really cool and very fascinating. And we have started to see like, this has been happening for a little while now, but like, If I am lying on my side or sometimes when I'm standing or walking, I'll feel just like a little something pushing out and then eventually it'll go back in. So it's cool to see him sticking out like, I don't know, I imagine elbows or something from my body or feet. Here are two more little baby updates. According to the website, it says, this is the week that the testicles make their way down the abdomen to the scrotum. Some full-term babies, roughly 3 to 4%, are born with undescended testicles, but they usually make the trip down sometime before their first birthday. Interesting. The babies also have, at this point, tiny little fingernails and toes that have reached the tips of their fingers by now. So, yeah, I think those are my main updates for this week. Hi, everyone. Just popping in to say, if you're enjoying this episode, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And follow us on Instagram at Week by Week Podcast. So on to week 35. Dave, my husband, is here, and we talk about the virtual birthing class we attended, which was so helpful. And one little correction before I move forward, we talk about the Group B strep test I took this week, and I refer to it as GSB, not GBS, because dyslexia is awesome. So let's do this. Whee! Woohoo! Yaha! <laughs> we are getting close to the end of this whole thing. This week, I would say overall, was a positive change of pace. Last week, I was feeling really down for a lot of it and anxious and was having a hard time feeling as grounded, I think, as I wanted to. There's just obviously a lot of stress and anticipation right now. And with the updates of the baby's growth and having to go in multiple times a week now, 
and having the pregnancy be more considered high risk now, it's definitely been a little tough. But we had an appointment today that was really positive. It was our first one in a while that felt really positive through and through than anything else. Yes, it was wonderful. It was great. So the baby has jumped up in percentile. So he had a little growth spurt, which is fantastic. Good job, baby. We are very proud of you. Good job, mama. And now weighs approximately 5 pounds, 11 ounces. That's correct. Which, shout out to my sister, way to my sister when she was born. Shout out to his auntie. So that was really, really reassuring to hear. It felt like our doctor felt positive about it and I think took a little bit of a weight off of both of our shoulders. It did. His movement also looked fantastic Mm -hmm. uh, when we went to the appointment. And our doctor said he looked like a very happy baby with all those moves. So very happy to see that. I had a crazy experience this week. And my appointment, not this last one, but the one before that, I had a day of contractions where Mm -hmm. it felt like period cramps all day, basically. I felt like I was going to get my period. And she could even see it on the NST when we did that the little spike. And she said, as long as I wasn't having more than one per every 10 minutes or so, I should be good. So nothing to worry about naturally. And you haven't really had any- I haven't had any since. Since that. No, yeah. 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 But a very strange experience, and I think made both of us, as you said, wake up and feel the anticipation. Good morning. And yeah, so that was that was crazy. Mm-hmm. The other thing we did is I think we've mentioned before, but we are giving birth at Cedars. Yep. And Cedars is now instead of doing their in-person class, they're doing an online birthing class. So we took a six hour online birthing class this week. Yep. Which was great. It really was. Definitely if you're in this pandemic and wanting something like that, it I would great. highly recommend it. There were people that were like us weeks away there were people that were months away from from their date so if it's something that appealed we really got a lot out of it and the nurse it was run by a why can't i think of the word because i'm pregnant a delivery nurse thank you it was run by a delivery nurse and i don't know if that's the technical term but that's as good as we're going to do hey, right now it sounds really accurate to me and it is what she's doing who was fantastic yeah clearly really passionate about her job and had great information was a mother of two herself with i think a nine month old so yeah. she really was in it <laughs> so let's reflect on some of our notes from this birthing class yeah honestly it was great because they went through like where do we go? Where do we park? Like just some of those yeah, basic starting stuff. Starting even with that. And then what are the markers to know when you need to, to decide to come into the hospital? Just a good checklist for things like that. I wrote down the list from the slide that said, how do I know if my body's getting ready for labor? And it says dropping, so the baby getting lower, your mucus plug falling out, which can happen, sounds like anywhere from 36 weeks and beyond. It's a marker, but it doesn't mean like, my mucus plug came out, time to go to the hospital. No, yeah. And she also said explicitly, if your mucus plug falls out and you see it in the toilet, you don't need to reach in there and grab it. You don't even need to bring it. They'll believe you. And so I thought like that was probably good advice for anybody who <laughs> has their baggies ready for their mucus plugs. Yeah, it really, it really felt like something that happened often enough that they needed to call it out. She said you can breathe better. So you're starting to feel like your lungs aren't as squished because he's dropping down. Braxton Hicks which I've been having for a long time. And that, again, is your body preparing for labor, but not necessarily an indication of labor. Yeah, that's been happening for well over a month. Fatigue, nausea, and vomiting. So those were some things that she mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then all sorts of things about labor and what the different stages are and the things to be aware of in each stage and the things that are a part of each stage. That there are multiple phases and what to be aware of and to at least be as prepared as you can for what could be a part of each stage of labor. And another thing that I really appreciated was that they gave like kind of time frames for how long each stage Mm -hmm. could last. And there's a big range. A very big range. So that's, you know, like the early labor could be 20 hours. Active labor could be four to eight hours. The transition phase where you're really getting 
into the most intense phase can be two to four hours. So, you know, you just stretch that out at the furthest end of all of them and we're well over a day. So Dave is going to have a stopwatch <laughs> and he's going to monitor all of these. Mm -hmm. and, a, and I guess a sundial. And a sundial. Yeah, both. <laughs> Be prepared. Something I found really, really interesting was talking about the hormones. And Dave, would you want to read this list of hormones that are the main hormones in labor? Are you just doing this so that I have to try and pronounce these? I'm doing it so because there's one in particular that I don't want to pronounce. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so here are the main labor hormones. Relaxin, which I love that that's the name of a hormone is relaxin. And that's what it is. It is a hormone that releases relaxing. Prostaglandin, oxytocin. Oh, I have oxytocin on there twice. I <laughs> was just about to comment that she wrote that twice because that's the good one. That's the that's the very that's the love, that's the love hormone. hormone. So it's very on brand for Celeste to write oxytocin twice in a row. And also extraordinarily important for both going into labor sustaining labor and breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Endorphins, adrenaline, and prolactin. So Dave and I talked about this, but something we found really interesting and makes total, total sense is some of these hormones can kind of counteract or work against each other depending on what phase you're in. So if you're starting to be in active labor, you really need that flood of oxytocin. And that's actually, as a side note, if you're getting induced and use Pitocin, that's a synthetic form of oxytocin, and that's what they're using to try to get those contractions to start. So if you are having the flood of oxytocin, and then let's say you go to the hospital, and all of a sudden you're in a new environment, you are dealing with the reality of now I'm going to, or you know, anticipating giving birth. You're around people that you don't know necessarily. You may know your doctor, but your OB may not be there right when you get in or for hours after you're there. Yeah, because at first you really deal with the nurses and then it's only at the very end of labor that your doctor comes in. Uh, your adrenaline can spike and adrenaline counteracts oxytocin. And so they were saying that it's really important to try to relax and get back into that loving, relaxed place so that your adrenaline can go down and then the labor can pick back up and continue. But it can actually slow your labor down Yes, when you get there because you get a, an adrenaline spike. She gave the example of an animal who's giving birth in the wild and then a predator comes toward her. And even if she is like about to push that baby out, somewhere in her, the adrenaline will kick in and she will be able to run to get to a place for safety. And then once the adrenaline dips down again and she's safe and her baby's safe, resume that act of labor. So bodies are fascinating. It's in us. It's, it's the animal us. part of us. A couple other things. They talked a little bit about like what labor contractions feel like. The contractions become stronger as labor progresses and can mainly be in the front or the back, depending on where it's happening in your body. But typically it can come from your back and go around to the top of your belly and then it's like pushing down. So that makes sense, obviously, because you're trying to get that baby to get lower and lower. And your water can break. Sometimes it doesn't break till you get to the hospital. Sometimes they have to break it themselves at the hospital. But once your water breaks, it can either be a high leak, which is like a trickle, or a gush if it's a low leak. And then she said a way to know if your water breaks and it's not just vaginal discharge is that you once your water breaks, it continues to leak. So if you're unsure, you can wear a pad or a new pair of underwear or even just sit on the toilet and if there is continual le leaking at, after that, that'll be a good indication that your water broke. She said to call your doctor right away after your water breaks and ask them if they want you to go straight to the hospital or if they are okay with you laboring at home for a little bit. Mm -hmm. All really good information. This week, I got tested for the GSB or group beta strep test. And there's no real delicate way to put this. But it's basically they take a large Q-tip and so they swab the inside and the outside of your vagina and then they also swipe your butthole. <laughs> that sounds pretty efficient to me. Uh, <laughs> so 
According to Google, pregnant women are routinely tested for GBS in late pregnancy, usually between the 35th and 37th week. It's a simple, inexpensive, and painless test. So the reason they do it is that women go on and off cycles of carrying this group B strep in their body. So she explained it that usually it goes in cycles of every four to six weeks. And it's not a problem. It's just like a natural thing that happens to the body. But it can expose the baby to bacteria if you're born and you're positive for it during one of your positive cycles. So basically what they do is they just give you antibiotics or they give you antibiotics uh, during birth as well to protect the baby from that bacteria. Again, not good or bad, just something that you want to know so you and your baby can be as safe as possible. We definitely know at least a date range. Oh, yes. Oh, this is big news. So because of the placenta and because my doctor wants the placenta to function as well as possible during the birth process and, you know, to keep the baby safe... She wants me to give birth at the beginning of the 39th week or earlier, you know, somewhere between the 37th week window and the 39th week. So next week can start to pick up some of the stuff to try to naturally get my body going, aka sex, eating dates, walking, eating pineapple, eating spicy foods, all that kind of stuff. And old wives tales and total science, anything, (laughs) anything and everything. And you know what? I'll keep you posted on what works for me or doesn't. But if the natural ways of getting labor going don't work, we have a tentative two days for our induction scheduled. And basically we give them two days that seem like they would be good days and they will give us it. They will email us a week before those days and tell us which one it is. And if I don't go into labor before that, we will go in and we will have our baby that day. We now know at least when we will start. Yes. So that's wild. And also it felt strange to be like, I might be picking his birthday. Yeah. But very exciting and makes it very real. And also that cuts down a whole week of the pregnancy, which in the scheme of 40 weeks doesn't feel like a lot, but when you only have four weeks left. Well, basically what we said was, there's four weeks left. No, there's not. There's three weeks left. Yes, it, it, it happens fast. So I also have started working on my birth plan and trying to really nail down my preferences so Dave and I can be on the same page and so he will also be able to advocate for me while... I'm giving birth. Mm -hmm. I found actually some really great links to some templates for birth plans and things to consider while creating your birth plan. And I also know that Cedars is going to send us a template for a birth plan. One final thing just on the preparedness. Dave put the car seat bases in both of our cars Mm -hmm. and we have the car seat all set up and ready to go. And then we also have the nurseries just about done. Mm -hmm. We have to put up a uh, shelf, and that's basically it. Mm-hmm. We're getting there. We're going to have a baby boy soon. It's just going to be a shelf. We're never going to put anything on it. It's a metaphor for possibility. Yeah. It's baby. for him. You put things on the shelf, baby. We don't put things on the shelf. You put things on the shelf. Take that with you. You put things on the shelf. And we've reached week 36 and month nine of pregnancy. Dave joins me again, and we talk a little bit more about that virtual childbirth class we went to last week, and also the virtual breastfeeding class we went to this week. They were both so helpful, and hopefully some of the thoughts and questions they raised from us will be helpful for you too. So here's week 36. Whoa. Whoa, 36, which according to my book means we're now in month nine. Whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa. We're, we are here. We made it. Very cool. We are here. We are here, and so is he. <laughs> this was a busy week for us. It was. We had, uh, personally, we had our one-year wedding anniversary. Yeah. We made it one year. Yeah. How does it feel? Feels great. Yeah? Yeah. You like being married to me? Oh, it's the best. <laughs> it's the best thing ever. <laughs> and as we've now joked a few times, 
I mean, how are we going to keep topping like every year? We're just going to have some big event every year for oh a while, I guess. We'll see. We won't have a baby again by next year, right? I don't think so, but... <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Based on the way the world's going, I, I don't think we should uh, discount anything, any possibility. Yeah, that's point. true. Everything's on the table right now. Yeah. Pregnancy-related on the day of our... Oh, he's kicking. On the our anniversary day... Stop talking about me, mama. He's like, hello, I can hear you. My ears work great now. My ears work great now. Okay, I'm going to stop repeating you. On our anniversary, something very special happened for me inside of this pregnancy and very sexy. Hot off the presses, according to Google, right here, right now. Your mucus plug is a protective collection of mucus in the cervical canal. During pregnancy, the cervix secretes a thick jelly-like fluid to keep the area moist and protected. This fluid eventually accumulates and seals the cervical canal, creating a thick plug of mucus. Ooh la la. <laughs> no, you love it. Uh, we're turning into like one of those radio shows. Um, Boizinga. <laughs> Ooh la la. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. Or, oh, yes, maybe we're going in the right direction here. Oh, maybe we're so close that we're starting to get a little, a little, a little loopy. punchy. A little loopy, a little punchy. So the mucus plug can either be a clear or kind of slightly yellow thing of mucus and then can have some streaks of some blood in there. So that's beautiful. Auga. <laughs> well, mine was definitely like enough that you were like, oh, this is something that came out and definitely had some streaks of blood in there. And then I had like a little bit come out in the next like day or two after that. Just some cool details for yeah. everyone. And it's also starting this, what has now been going on for a minute, which is every time something <laughs> happens like this, Celeste starts talking to me but like has these pauses in what she's saying. So she'd be like, baby. And then she'll pause for a long time. And I just start filling in like, okay, her water broke or okay, this is happening or something like that. And then it hasn't been anything yet, but it just tells me that I'm very much on high, high alert. alert. <laughs> so now the code basically is like, if I make a noise in the other room or I say baby, I try as quickly as possible to go, this is not baby related, if it's not. And so far it hasn't been. <laughs> I have been getting a lot more contractions. So both Braxton Hicks, I've definitely been feeling my stomach has been hard a lot, but then also some painful contractions as well. Nothing consistent, but enough to be uncomfortable. So we are on the right track. And next week I will get tested to see if there's any dilation. So fingers crossed there's some movement and we're going in the right direction. Mm-hmm. So moving on to some stats about the baby. Here are some week 36 milestones. Baby's about 18 to 19 inches long, 18 and a half, let's just say. Weighs approximately six pounds and is the round the size of a papaya. Or a bunch of kale. Or a bunch of kale, which is ironic since you can't with kale. I can't with kale. I still just have no interest in kale during this pregnancy. The baby's lungs are maturing and producing surfactant, which is a substance that will help the baby's lungs take in air outside the womb. Well, baby has been having a lot of hiccups. And sometimes I feel like if I rub my belly, he kind of like moves around and responds to that. And sometimes I'm like, oh, am I soothing you? Am I helping? Or like I'll stand up and kind of rock from side to side and it'll help. It's really sweet. I really like to see it when Aww. she does it. But then sometimes he's like, no, I'm I'm just in my hiccups and I have to let him be in his experience. Mm -hmm. So there we go. This says that baby's hearing is getting more and more sharp in these last couple weeks. And studies show that they might even recognize our voice or favorite songs at birth. Well, it'll be a lot of the musical Beetlejuice. I know. If, if we I've play been... any of that, that's probably what he'll recognize. What he'd recognize the most, at least from this last month or so. I've been listening to so much Beetlejuice. I don't know why, but it's hitting the spot. It's not a bad musical. I mean, no. but I'm just saying that's just the quirk of of how things have 
have gone. And then the baby is definitely dropping. Yes. Getting lower and lower. And you can see it on the outside and then in the ultrasounds too, because obviously we had our two non-stress tests, two ultrasounds this week as well. And to get his head for the measurement, it's like it's getting lower and lower for the positioning of the ultrasound wand. Monitor? Wand. Wand. Wand sounds cooler. It sounded cool. And then I was like, are wands only inserted? Because I we're obviously not doing the insertion kind of ultrasound. Accio babyonica. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, that was right. Babyonica. No. Actually, that just sounds like a name now. Yeah. <laughs> we're not naming our child Annika. <laughs> no. no, we're not. <laughs> Nothing against that name. Just not a boy's name that we would pick. We did look at some Scandinavian names, though. We did. So the other thing that we did this week is we did classes, more classes through Cedars uh, via the website, and we had a breastfeeding class and we had a baby basics class. And I would highly recommend these classes. I found they were really helpful and also they really encourage asking questions and it was a really great environment to get some basic facts about what you're coming up to do. Mm -hmm. For all the classes, they send you a packet afterwards in the mail. We only have looked at the first one from the birthing class, but it's a really in-depth, like step-by-step, but then also just like great charts Mm -hmm. and great information, you know, frequently asked questions and answers. We just have been blown away by the level of information and help that they've given to us. Mm -hmm. In the uh, book that Dave was just talking about, they had a chart that had like basically pain management, I would say. And it had like what your response as the person going through it would be. And like it gave you language and also a good way to kind of frame how you're thinking about what type of pain management you want during your labor and when you want to change courses, if you have one set or one idea in mind. So, yeah, it had a chart where it, to boil it down, it went from at the top, it was like, give me drugs, give me drugs immediately. I want all the drugs. Down at the bottom of the chart was, I want no drugs. I want no interference at all, no pain management. Mm-hmm. And it, we're somewhere kind of in the middle. Yeah, middle to the bottom. Mm-hmm. Um, but the great thing about it was that it would say what that looked like in practicality. But then next to it, there was a column that was just like the reality. Mm -hmm. And basically the thrust of it was the two extremes are just impossible. Like you can't do that. It wouldn't be healthy. It wouldn't be good for the baby or the mom. And then it's basically like, where are you on the spectrum inside of those two polar opposites and figuring that out? But it was really helpful to talk to have it on paper and mm-hmm. say, this is what this looks like. Well, and it was nice to see the way that they phrased it because we were able to have a conversation where I could say like, oh, I don't think I will be disappointed in myself if I opt for this type of like pain management or whatever. But I want to choose for me what feels like I can still be as much in my body as possible or, you know, everything is in service of his best experience. And obviously that's personal and very, very up to your particular body and your particular baby. So no judgment for any direction, mm-hmm. but it was a nice way to have that conversation. Yeah. And and to have some like boots on the ground, this is what it looks like, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Really helpful. I also wanted to just touch base really quickly about the breastfeeding class and the baby basics class. It was really great the way that they broke down the breastfeeding, what to look for, how many sucks you're even looking for when they latch uh, the first day, the difference in how much you're going to produce from the colostrum to the kind of transitional phase to the full when your milk comes in, different holds for the baby during breastfeeding, just kind of markers of like how many diapers he should be going through in order to know that he's getting enough at this point or what the general kind of recommendation for numbers of feeds and stuff is. And so I found that really, really helpful. They also put in like warning signs of what to watch. Like I have a list here that says like, if you're not getting at least eight feedings in, obviously this is for early on. If he's falling asleep in the first five minutes of feeding, if you're not hearing swallowing by day five, because it said around day five, you'll start to actually hear 
to swallow when the baby is feeding. Fewer than six diapers, like I said, or fewer than three bowel movements in four days. So fewer than six diapers in a day, and then fewer than three bowel movements in the course of four days. If you're, they're still having that black or brown bowel movement on day four, because as they start to have your breast milk in them, they are moving away from that kind of like tar-like. The meconium. Meconium bowel movement into something that's a little like more yellow and you can kind of see mustard. some fat in it. Grainy mustard. Grainy mustard. Never look at grainy mustard the same way. If your nipples are hurting a lot and it's not getting any better, if your breasts have not become fuller by day four, because that's usually around when the milk comes in, if your baby doesn't feel satisfied after most feedings or is fussy most of the time, these are some indications that maybe something isn't working. So I found it really helpful to have that list. I there mean, there was so, so many, much. Yeah, I mean, so many different aspects that they went into gave you, you know, just really great advice, and we just couldn't speak highly enough. They were ver- and, and, and so responsive to questions. Yeah. And, and this was run by a lactation consultant who yeah. works at Cedars. And so all of them were by nurses that they do this job every day. And then I'm going to say quickly for about the baby basics class. I also found that to be really helpful. And they went over bathing and they went over jaundice and little rashes and feeding options and burping and holding the baby and changing the diaper. And we have a stuffed animal bunny my sister made that was like our stand in for like breastfeeding positions. And it currently has a diaper on it, diapered by the one and only David Kimball Hill III. I find it so cute. And do it on a non-moving inanimate object. Let's see how I can do (laughs) in the real scenario. Luckily, you're going to have a lot of chances to practice. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Week by Week. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. And follow me on Instagram at Week by Week Podcast. Check out the show notes for additional resources I used or referenced during this episode. This podcast was produced during the COVID-19 pandemic and recorded remotely. Our show today was produced by me, Celeste Busa, and Dave Hill, and edited by Douglas Sarine and Colleen Beasley. Week by Week is a Gumption Pictures production.